Municipal governments are local elected authorities. They include cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. In the political trenches, local government at work, we dive into the top issues facing local governments across Canada. My name is Christopher Brown, host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ian McCormick, president of Strategic Steps Incorporated. Today, we'll be discussing the role of the chief administration officer, what happens when your community gets inspected by the province, the budget process in a post-pandemic world, and threats against local elected officials. Later in the show, we will sit down with the CAO of Parkland County, Laura Swain, and the former CAO for the RM of Sherwood in Saskatchewan, Pam Malichis. Ian, how are you? I'm doing well, except her last name is actually Malik. I want to start with the biggest story, and that is here in Alberta. Uh, the city of Chestermere was inspected by the province of Alberta. Um, you have been on the inspection side of these uh, type of ordeals. What is it like when a city is inspected by a province or when they call for an inspection of how council and administration is working? It is an ordeal, actually, now that you mentioned it, Chris. It's an ordeal. It really upends the municipality, but it's often the end of a process that has begun sometime into the, in the past. In Alberta, anyway, a group of citizens can petition the minister for one of these inspections. Minister can call an inspection on his or her own volition, though often there's a lot of evidence for that as well. Or council itself could ask for an inspection to occur. And the scope of the inspection differs based on where the smoke is. There is work done in advance uh, to to have a bit of an idea about where the problem might be. Then the province hires an independent person or company to conduct this investigation. In this case with Chestermere, it was uh, George Cuff, who most, if not all, local government people who are watching this will, will know. And what it comprises then is a review of documentation, a whole series of interviews with obviously with council, typically with senior managers. And if there is a petition or external complaints, oftentimes the people who lead that as well. Then there is things like an open house where we hear from uh, residents who may have things that they want to talk about as well. What we do find usually when this happens, though, is you have to follow the smoke. And there's a saying we used, and that was, it's never about what it's about. And the the understanding of local government by uh, people who happen to live there or businesses who operate is not 100% in alignment, say, with what the legislation says. So even though there is an inspection that may be called, it may end up being essentially much ado about nothing. That said, there's always some way a municipality can can improve. But if there is an inspection, usually there is reasonable cause for having a, a, a good look. Something that was instituted fairly recently were real rules of procedural fairness as well. So it can't just be an inspector's opinion, either agreed to or not, by the minister. But there may there also has to be some circular conversation that happens within that municipality as well to give those people who have uh, been named, for example, the opportunity to provide a rationale and to hear some of the evidence that may have been collected against them. Coming out of that, and it usually takes a few months, But coming out of that, then the minister can either decide is is one of two ways. The minister was operating, sorry, the municipality was operating as it ought to according to legislation or it wasn't. And if it wasn't, the minister can then provide a series of recommendations to bring it back on track or a series of directives, which are mandatory and must be done by a certain point. So uh, as we speak at the moment, Chris, Chestermere hasn't been fully complete, hasn't completely undergone this process because typically the last step is a report from the inspector and the province to the public, anybody who wants to attend, where they release the report uh, publicly. And if you look on Alberta Municipal Affairs website, uh, most, if not all, municipal inspection reports are there for public viewing. One of the interesting things about Chestermere was there hasn't actually been a municipal inspection called in Alberta since 2018. So we've gone four years now with none. And prior to that, there were two or three or four happening almost every year. So to me, that's one of the really interesting things to say that there likely was a compelling reason in this case to conduct the inspections. I'll just leave it at that. But so we'll see what happens. 
Alberta is not the only province that allows these inspections. All provinces, if I'm not mistaken, if you correct me if I'm wrong here, Ian, would allow the provincial government, the Minister of Municipal Affairs to uh, hold these inspections or for municipalities to call an inspection for themselves, correct? Yeah, they're not always called inspections, however, and sometimes they're judicial reviews. Sometimes they are done by the provincial or territorial authority. And sometimes they call in the outside independent experts as well. So there is a format. And that's one of the reasons, of course, is because municipalities are uh, in control of local government institutions right across the country. So really, they can kind of do whatever they want. And so in in this case, this is a way of having a look into what's actually happening in a municipality. As we are heading into the later part of winter or the beginning part of winter, municipalities are turning to the budget process. They have started earlier on with administration, getting ideas of what they would like to see in 2023. But we are seeing uh, cities starting to propose their uh, operating capital budgets for 2023. And we are seeing some municipalities, cities and towns and even uh, counties who are proposing potential increases in service cuts because of the post-pandemic world that we are living in. Uh, Toronto is saying that if they don't get a bailout from the province and the federal government, things are going to be hard for them. We are seeing uh, Sarnia warning in Ontario, warning of potential increases to residential taxes because of the service cuts that they had to do over the last few years. And now they're all bringing them back. So, In this challenging time for municipalities, for communities of all sizes, because Toronto's dealing with it, Sarnia, I'm just even Calgary, my where I'm located, they're seeing a potential three to four to five, even eight percent increase in taxes. How important is it for the budget process to be done correctly this time? Not that they're saying I'm not saying that they haven't been done correctly in the past. But in a post-pandemic world, how challenging is it going to be for these new elected officials who just got elected last year, this year, to present a budget that could see a large increase in property taxes? I think it's really one of the unfortunate parts about our election cycle in most parts of the country is that local government elected officials take over just as budgets are being created. And they're not necessarily experts in municipal finance or any finance for that matter. So... uh, I do have certainly some empathy for that. You got a bit of a perfect storm coming out of a uh, pandemic with significant aspects of inflation. We're seeing a lot of downloading uh, as well. So, and a series of other factors, depending on where you are in the province, things like natural disasters and insurance costs and whatnot. So there is a real pull on the resources that are available to municipalities. And in all of Canada, I think in all of Canada, I could be corrected. Municipalities have to prevent, present a balanced budget, unlike the other orders of government. So what that means is if they want to spend a dollar, they have to figure out where that dollar is going to come from. And where it comes from is either property tax, although not all of Canada can rely on property tax, north, for example. It comes from fees and charges of one sort or another, what you're paying to get into the pool or what you pay for your building permit. It comes from transfers from other orders of government, which are often either fee for service, grants in lieu, plain old unconditional grants as well. So all of those pieces together kind of dictate what the available budget is. At the other end of that, of course, is what we're going to spend money on. And everything that council has decided to do, to back to time immemorial, has been the result of a political decision. Any change to that is a political decision, any increase, any decrease, getting rid of it, same sort of thing, those are all political decisions. So they're really tough to do. Understanding what the priorities of the municipality are is critical. So we're seeing things like priority-based budgeting being a real good way of starting to look at what's important in the relative sense, not that the thing at the bottom of the list isn't important, but maybe it's just not as timely or as relevant as it used to be. So that's pulling municipalities, and you've you've made reference to a lot of the big ones. The small ones are in exactly the same boat. It always costs more to service a residential taxpayer than it does to, than you do, and then revenue comes in to, to pay for that person. So even things like the the split between residential or non-residential assessment tax comes into play as well. So municipalities at that other end can either reduce services, well, that's probably they can reduce services or they can eliminate services as well. So they oftentimes they're a bit of both. They're going to try and increase the revenue as able. They're trying to try and reduce costs as able as well. So in a lot of ways, I don't really, I don't have a, I have a lot of time for those who are trying to make that work for the people who live in their own communities. It's tough. 
It is. And uh, as you say, downloading is one of the big issues that a lot of municipalities, not even here in just Alberta, but across this great country who are, are being faced with right now. And with provincial governments also feeling the strain of the last few years, it's going to be a challenging future for smaller and remote communities, but also the larger cities as well. So it is going to be a one that I'm going to be watching with bated breath because I can imagine that there's a lot of councillors and mayors mm-hmm. and city staff who are looking at this budget and hoping that a their job might be safe for administration but also where the money is going to be coming from to have the same service levels that we have in the past because if there's one thing i've learned in my time in municipal uh, or local governments is you cut something you will hear about it <laughs> from the local residents in a very timely fashion but i want to turn to our last subject and that is threats um, over the last few weeks, we have seen reports from the mayor of Windsor, the uh, mayor of Anatonish in uh, Nova Scotia, saying that the rise of threats against local municipal politicians is on the rise. Now, I've worked in, as I said in the past, I've worked in municipal government, and I can tell you that as a communications person, you're the front line of seeing the nasty things that people send in. So this is not a new, uh, new idea that there's been threats against local governments, but there are threats that are being more prominent with the rise of social media. Um, Is this just the new world that we live in, Ian, or is this something that we need to take a serious hard look at and municipalities need to start having a serious conversations about the threats that are against their local leaders? So I I think it is kind of a, a new world. However, I don't think we need to accept it that this is something that is intolerable for those who have chosen to serve the public, particularly those who've chosen to do it in good faith. And it's not just the elected officials, it's administrators as well, as well who are being victimized by people who are uh, taking their frustrations out on frontline people or even city or county managers. So uh, it's come, you made a reference to social media. I think the online building of communities has been something that has not always been for the better. In my book about the DNA of great leaders, I talk about the coffee shop Senate, the self-appointed common sense group that just says, if you're not doing what we think you should be doing, you're obviously doing the wrong thing. And you can start to get that slow snowball moving. When you look at Facebook and rant and rave sites, whenever I bring that up at a, at a council orientation, say there's a, there's a nervous chuckle that goes throughout the room as well, because they know that they're not there to be providing kudos to municipal elected officials. So it is something that I think we need to think about. And it's not something that need, that is, it is alone. The media is involved in receiving those complaints as well, as are kind of other sectors of society too. So in fact, something we are thinking about as a company is putting together a bit of a symposium to try and figure out what the issue really is and then how to deal with it in our own context recognizing that it is different from place to place, but it is real. And if you ask any elected official or any administrator, I'd be surprised if you got any of them to say that this is something that they haven't seen before. It's it's intolerable, but it's common. Well, it's a good point that you just raised because I, I mentioned the the Windsor and the Anatonish in Nova Scotia uh, scenarios where their mayors were received uh, threats during an election, but also outside of an election administration is not uh, clean on this issue because they will also get threats as well, whether it be the local grader operator who is driving their, the grader down the street and someone plows the snow too close to someone's door and they can't get in. They might get threats or thrown uh, verbal spars at the, towards them. So administration is also not uh, immune to this issue, right? Not only are they not immune, they have less ability to push back than the elected officials do. And so they are in an even tougher spot. So while the the, the topic is the same, that it's abuse of officials, elected or administrative, the way we deal with it, the way we tolerate it and the way we deal with it, I think has to be different, nuanced difference with those who are elected versus those who are appointed to. And in both of those cases, it's a really wicked problem. And in speaking with people around the country, around the world, it's not unique to Western Canada is not unique to Canada. I've heard the same thing out of the UK. I've heard the same thing out of out of Australia. I've heard the same thing out of the United States, all for very similar reasons. And I suspect it's got something to do with the reach of the tools that these people are using to get their information and then to, in some cases, carry out their threats as well. 
could it be a reason why people aren't going into the local government uh, field anymore, whether it be elected officials or even administration? Because during my time in my the municipality that I worked for, um, I had people come up to me and saying, I'm leaving, I'd like to stay, but the threats that I get from outside people yelling at me saying that they know where I live, it's just enough and I'm going to leave. Um, could this could the threats of social media and what people are saying online stop people from going into a, a local governments? Absolutely. I, I would not be surprised if that's the biggest reason that people either choose not to go in the first place, I don't need to deal with this, or choose not to run for second or subsequent terms with an under, with, once they learn what's really going on. And just think about the, the, the capacity, the expertise, the experience that we lose because somebody says, I don't need to deal with this. I can go do something else some other way. And it's, it's pretty common that I will hear from a current or former elected official or administrator say, I want to come work with you, for example, because you guys don't have to deal with this. And they're right. And I think that that's terribly sad. And it's going to hurt us in the long run, uh, local government, any order of government for that matter. And put the media into here as well. We, we're probably seeing people say, I don't need to get into the media because I don't want to deal with that stuff either. Um, I want to thank you uh, for chatting again, because it's always a great introduction. And we will be right back with our interviews with the current CAO for Parkland County and the former CAO for sure, the RM of Sherwood in Saskatchewan. We'll be right back, guys. Looking forward to it. Today we have with us a couple of people who have experience with the role of the Chief Administrative Officer. Both have held that role. I'd like to welcome Laura Swain. Laura is the Chief Administrative Officer for Parkland County, just east, uh, sorry, just west of Edmonton. She's been in that role efficiently, efficiently for uh, about nine months, but before that she was acting in the role for a year and a half. Prior to that, she'd been with the province for a few years as well. And uh, sorry, you've been with Parkland for a few years in the province before that. So welcome, Laura. It's nice to see you. Thanks, Ian. Great to see you as well. Thanks. Our other guest is Pam Mallet. Uh, Pam runs a company in Regina called Clear Plan Consulting. She's been doing that for the past couple of years. And before that, through 2017 through 2020, she was the CAO, longest serving CAO, she tells us, of the rural municipality of Sherwood, just outside Regina. She has also worked in the past and currently with the Global Transportation Hub and other entities in the public sector in Saskatchewan too. Should actually suggest that uh, for full disclosure, Pam also does do some work for strategic steps in Saskatchewan. And actually Pam and I have known each other for more than a decade. So welcome, uh, Pam. Thank you, good to see you. So thank you both for joining us. I'll just uh, lead off with a couple of questions. Maybe Laura, since I uh, introduced you first, we'll go with this one for you and maybe follow up with Pam. And as you would like to uh, lead the conversation, let's go. So the first question, kind of for both of you, is what made you choose the municipal sector over potentially other opportunities? Because both of you have a background that is not just uh, municipal. And the second is, what made you look for the CAO role either now or previously too? So Laura, do you want to uh, take a stab at this one first? Yeah, great. Thanks, Ian. Um, I would say my decision to, with both of those questions, were kind of just a random series of events that happened. So um, first off, um, municipal, I worked for the province for about five years in policy and corporate and strategic planning. Uh, and a job popped up at Parkland County in the corporate planning realm. So I decided to make the leap um, into municipal. Uh, I had never thought about municipal when I was going through school. I did a master of public administration and I had never even considered municipal. Uh, then once I started in the municipal realm, I just, I loved it so much. You were so close to the people. You, I remember one of my first days, the mayor walked into my office and I was like, oh my God, this is, it was just so strange um, coming from the province into this. And so, uh, yeah, I just, I, I fell in love with municipal government and I really enjoyed working at Parkland County. There was so much going on. It was so, so dynamic and um, lots of change at the time, good and bad when I first started here. And then um, what made me want to take the, you know, move into the CAO role? Uh, we had a CAO who 
um, was off at Parkland County and I ended up in the acting role. And also through a series of events, um, it took longer than anticipated to fill the CAO role. And so I ended up being in the acting and interim role for, um, yeah, about a year and a half to two years. Uh, and at the start, if you asked me, I said that I wasn't interested in, in being the full-time CAO at the county. Um, but as time progressed and as I started um, meeting other CAOs in the region, started dealing, dealing with people, had some really awesome mentors, um, that was what really drove me into wanting to uh, take on the CAO, CAO role. Um, and just the, we have a great team here at the county. And so that really helped make my decision. I really felt these are people I want to work with. Um, and a new council started. And I also thought, you know, this is a council that I want to work with. And I feel like I have a shared vision with them. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Laura. Pam, same questions to you then. Why municipal and why eventually CAO? Um, a little bit of a similar situation. It wasn't uh, a career that I had picked. Um, I was in provincial government prior to, and uh, I started getting um, more on the side of economic development and, and having my boots on the ground with infrastructure planning and so on within provincial government. And uh, an opportunity arose where I was almost uh, volunteered as the CAO role for the RM that I went to and, you know, didn't, uh, didn't want to turn away an opportunity, but um, it, it was about six months into my role where I, I really um, found my passion for that career choice. Um, but my passion was largely based on being able to work, as Laura had said, so close to the, the rate payers, the community. Um, I often joked that, you know, I, I didn't necessarily work for the council. I, I truly felt like I was there and worked for the people, right? I cared about the community, even though I didn't live in it. But, um, you know, the community and the rate payers really had my heart. So, and that's largely the reason why I stay in, in this field is because of the ability to help serve the public. I want to jump in on this because I found it quite fascinating that you both basically alluded to the fact that you fell into this position, whether it be through uh, a vacancy and then you were appointed as interim. But what was the biggest learning curve? Because you're both relative, well, uh, Laura, you are new to this position in the permanent position, but also you fell into this position as well. What was the biggest learning curve for both you? And I would say for me, definitely the biggest learning curve or the biggest thing that I had to contend with as a new CAO is what at what level do you bring counsel into certain discussions or certain items? Is it there's always that that area between administration and counsel, but there's a huge gray area in between. And so that was my biggest challenge is what do I update counsel on? What do I get their input on? What type of decisions is counsel involved with? And, and kind of rolling that up also to an administrative level, just working with the organization to try and bridge that gap between administration and council. So for me, that was definitely the biggest learning curve. Uh, for me, um, I would probably have to say, and I don't think that I have it mastered to this day, but um, my learning curve was the uh, undisclosed need for having to herd cats. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, dealing with several different personalities, several different agendas around that elected table becomes a very um, challenging objective to, to manage throughout the career. How do you how did you balance that? Because that is the one tricky thing that a lot of CAOs have to deal with, right? The will and direction of counsel, but the the ability to do work as administration. So you have to balance the needs and wants of what your counsel want and need with what your administration can and can't do. So how did you, as your role as CAO for the RM, balance that need and want? It's a good question because it, it requires a lot of time. And I was fortunate to have uh, a large enough staff that could continue to operate the admi administration side. But um, it took a lot of time invested in building that relationship with, with council, you know, leaving my footprint and heading to, you know, their place of business, getting to know them personally in and out. Um, oftentimes I refer to it as the game of survivor is you, you quickly learn to work with those alliances and uh, build that trust through the, through the alliance mechanism. But it's a tough, it's a tough 
goal to try and achieve. <laughs> so this is an interesting reason. Another interesting point then is it's presumably it's lonely at the top. Sometimes there are lots of things you can't talk to anybody about. Who do you go and who do you talk to? Um, what do you use as a as a way either to, to generate mentorship or where do you go with the own question, your own questions or where you can go to float ideas? Who do you kind of rely on? Pam, do you want to start? Um, well, in Saskatchewan, we have a really big support group with other administrators. Um, thankful to technology, we can do that through via Facebook and and uh, try and work together and support each other that way. Manitoba has um, excelled at that at the administrator level with um, local support for each administrator, but really relying on other colleagues that are in that profession. Um, I had the benefit of my mentor was also my university prof, so he was a good resource for me too. And uh, and and Ian, you over the years too have been a very good resource for me as well. Yeah, I would say similar to Pam. Um, I am so lucky to have so many amazing CAOs that I work with in the province. Uh, I, you know, over the last few years, I've been involved with the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board, and so I met some CAOs in the region through that. Uh, and also with my counterparts in Stony Plain and Spruce Grove. Uh, and then maybe about two years ago, I discovered the Alberta Rural Administrator Association. And so I became a part of that group. And they've just been amazing. I, uh, yeah, I just can't say enough about just the wonderful people that you're, you're able to talk to and share experiences with. And um, I was so excited to go to the RMA convention uh, this go around just because it was so nice to catch up with people and, and just chat and you know when you're experiencing certain issues you you don't feel so alone. Uh, I'm also lucky at the county that I have a really good senior management team that we can just openly talk about things we can openly share and I, I feel there's a lot of trust amongst that group as well. We are seeing younger people ascending to the rarefied air that is the corner office of CAO. And we're also seeing a lot more women, even rurally, that way, which kind of surprised me a little bit. I don't know if you're seeing anything similar or what you're seeing in terms of changes in the CAO ranks of the people you're dealing with as people, some people retire and other people come in. Pam, what are you seeing? Anything? Um, I think it is changing as well. Um, <clears throat> but I think the term in in office is also changing too. You know, I came from a very small town where the administrator there was with the town for 32 years and you you just don't see that anymore because of their own aspirations or because of the local politics too mm -hmm. um i'm encouraged and um, happy to see that women are a lot more women are going into the field as well but um you know what naturally i think that's desired because women have such ability to balance all of these different roles and responsibilities and and you know the day-to-day -day, uh, work and and life balance too is is different now yeah I would say um lots of younger CAOs on the especially on the rural side um I think smaller municipalities where maybe they're they're not looking for as much experience and um someone can move into that role who's maybe more at the start of their career um uh, so I've met lots of great people uh, through that and and more and more women getting into the role I think there's still not very many women CAOs in Alberta but it's it's starting to to get there and I think just the the mentorship by maybe the CAOs who have been in the role for a little bit longer I was just really pleasantly surprised at how willing they are to to support and share experiences and and support CAOs who are more junior in their career. In my series on the cross-board interviews with Chris Brown, shameless plug there, um, I sat down with mayors across Canada. And the one mayor that I sat down who spoke about this was the mayor of Wetaskiwin in Alberta. And he says it is so important for the mayors to have a good working relationship and not just a good working relationship, a good trust relationship with their CAO. How important is it for the CAO to also respond to that by also have a good working relationship and trust that your mayor is not going to go out of left field and throw a curveball in the middle of council that uh, the CAO is not prepared for. Absolutely necessary. I think even on a personal level, it's necessary because like you said, when you're at the top of that um, pyramid, you, you still need somebody to go to, right? Even if it's just to bounce ideas, thoughts, or potential decisions coming down. If you have your mayor or your Reeves support, uh, along the way, 
it continues to drive that momentum and the, that passion and vice versa. The mayor looks for that as well in, in the passion and momentum. Um, the trust thing is absolutely key <laughs> between the two relationships because, you know, whether or not it's um, each other's own team that are throwing curveballs, um, you have to be able to respond to them in, in, a, in a prompt manner. So having some of that forefront in that connection prior to and, and outside of regular council meetings is absolutely helpful. Yeah, absolutely. It's essential that there's a, I mean, for me, a strong working relationship between uh, the mayor and the CAO. You spend so much time with these people that you, you need to get along and, you, and just at a personal level, you need to, to be able to spend lots of time together. And so I'm lucky that I have a, a mayor I can do that with. And I think in addition, it, it is important to have that strong relationship with the mayor, but it's also important to ensure that you don't neglect the rest of council um, and you make sure that, you know, you, you're you're sharing that information with, with the whole group. And, and while you have those conversations with the mayor, I think it's important that um, the rest of council feels like they're included um, because the mayor's one vote. So, um, I, yeah. So just before we wrap up, though, I would like to kind of give a last word to to both of you, see if there's anything that you think you'd like to say that we haven't asked you about. So I don't know, Laura, anything that you wanted to say as we wrap it up? Oh, that's a good question. Um, not not too much. I think that, um, you know, if people are looking to get involved with municipal government and or, or moving into the CAO role, I think it's just such a fulfilling career. Uh, and obviously there's, a lot of challenges and change and different dynamics, but I think um, just the people that I meet uh, that are involved in in Alberta municipalities, regardless of the level, whether it's you know the person in the egg field uh, all the way up to the CAO, there's just such amazing people um, that are part of Alberta municipalities, and I'm just very um, grateful that I landed into to this career and this role. Well, that's too broad of a question for me because I could talk <laughs> about municipal government all day long, but <clears throat> I'll maybe just follow Laura's theme that, yeah, there's, um, there, while well, there's continuing need to evolve more administration employees um, here in Saskatchewan, at, at least, there's always retention issues or, or um, CAO retention issues, yeah, to say the very least, but I don't think there's any other career, in my opinion, where you can get the dynamics like you can in, in local government. So that's um, the positive for me is there's so much opportunity in local government. So well, and maybe if I can just say one more thing, yeah. um, I think if, if there are people who are looking to get involved, you know, reach out to your um, whether it's the local government administrator association or Alberta rural administrator association. There's always such great resources with the groups as part of that. And um, that was the, the best move I ever made for my career. And, and my sanity was just, just meeting those people and, and you, you don't feel like you're so alone and, and just, you know, getting some of that career advice. Thanks. And most provinces, if not all provinces and territories, have similar associations as well, if anybody's looking from outside Alberta yeah. or Saskatchewan. So with that, uh, we'd like to wrap up this part of the political trenches and say thank you both. We'll follow your careers with interest, not in a not creepy way. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. So thank you all on behalf of Chris Brown and myself. Thank you. Thank you. So Ian, we've talked about budgeting in the post-pandemic world. We talked about threats. We had a great conversation with current CAO for Parkland County, the former CAO for the RM of Sherwood. Great interview, great episode all around again. Don't you agree? That was fun. And actually hearing from those people who are in the trenches, if you like, really actually illuminates what we do what we're talking about so i really do appreciate both of them for coming on and talking to us as the show progresses and grows we are excited to be bringing you more local stories and local people who are making our lives uh more better for their service to their communities um but i want to take a moment and say uh in episode two which is b for big changes we posed a question to uh the twitter verse and all all that is twitter verse and instagram verse about strong mayor powers and we did a quick poll and i can tell you that as of that conversation 81 percent of people who responded to the uh, poll 
said, no, they do not want strong mayor powers in Alberta, Saskatchewan, outside of Ontario. They do not want it. 81%, uh, 8, 19% said yes, they would love to see strong mayor powers. Are you are you surprised about that? I, I'm not, to no, be honest. Not in, no, and I recognize this, this, the poll is self-selected as well. It's not a random sample of Canadians. So those in, it's those who are informed and are in, this, in the sector and know the nuance of it, I'm not surprised. And I can tell you that I, I did get a few comments when I posted it on Instagram from uh, newly elected uh, Ontario councillors saying, don't do what Doug Ford's doing. So here we are. Um, but the this week's question, this week's question is going to be asked later on next week is, what about local threats? Do you believe more people are leaving the local government because of online threats? Yes or no? So check that out on our Twitter page. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook. Highly recommend you do it because we do post things that we're reading, what we're seeing out there, stories from municipalities from across this great country. So Ian, always a pleasure to have you on. uh, Always a pleasure to chat with you about uh, local governments and being in the political trenches with you. You too, Chris. Thanks so much for shepherding this little enterprise along. So with that, this has been the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. We will be back in two weeks' time with the letter D. Talk to you later, guys.